In the serene wilderness of the Sierra Nevada mountains, nestled amidst towering pines and whispering breezes, lies a haunting mystery that has captivated the minds of investigators and true crime enthusiasts alike for decades. Welcome to the chilling tale of the Keddy Cabin murders, a brutal crime that unfolded within the walls of a seemingly peaceful family cabin, shattering the tranquility of a close-knit community. It was a calm evening in the small community of Keddy, California, on April 11, 1981. The isolated cabin resort, known for its picturesque beauty, was a sanctuary for those seeking respite from the chaos of everyday life. But what should have been an ordinary night turned into a nightmare that forever scarred the landscape and the souls of those involved. Inside Cabin 28, a gruesome crime scene was discovered, sending shockwaves through the tight-knit community. Two members of the Sharp family, Sue, the mother, and her son, John, along with John's friend, Dana, who was staying the night, were found bound and bludgeoned to death. The brutality of the murders was unfathomable, leaving investigators grappling with a sense of disbelief and horror. Adding to the mystery, Sue's daughter, Tina, was missing. As the investigation unfolded, a myriad of questions emerged. Who could commit such an unspeakable act of violence in a place that seemed immune to darkness? What motive lay hidden behind the blood-stained walls? And perhaps most hauntingly, why did it seem like justice continued to elude the victims, their shattered lives becoming mere footnotes in a harrowing chapter of American crime? Join us as we delve into the twisted labyrinth of the Keddy Cabin murders, peeling back the layers of secrecy and unveiling the chilling secrets that have remained buried for over four decades. In the summer of 1979, Glenna Susan Sharp who was commonly known as Sue among her close ones, decided to leave her residence in Connecticut and start anew with her five children. Her decision came after she separated from her abusive ex-Navy husband, James Sharp. Sue opted to relocate to Northern California, where her brother Don lived at the time. Upon reaching California, she secured a rental of a one-bedroom trailer that had previously been occupied by her brother at the Claremont Trailer Village in Quincy. However, as time passed, Sue realized that she needed a more suitable home for her family. In the subsequent autumn, she found a new residence in Cabin 28, located in the serene Sierra Nevada resort community of Keddy. During its prime, Keddy used to be a picturesque resort featuring a rustic hotel, bar and restaurant, all surrounded by cozy cabins within a serene woodland. However, by the 1980s, the cabins had fallen into disrepair and were no longer attracting the visitors they once did. Struggling financially, the resort decided to convert the cabins into affordable housing. Despite Cabin 28's less than ideal condition, it represented a significant upgrade from the trailer Sue had previously occupied. The opportunity arose when the former sheriff of Plumas County, Sylvester Douglas Thomas, vacated the cabin. Sue and her children, namely 15-year-old John, 14-year-old Sheila, 12-year-old Tina, and her two younger sons, 10-year-old Rick and 5-year-old Greg, settled into the new home in November 1980. While the cabin needed some improvements, it provided ample space for the children. Moreover, many other families resided in the vicinity, fostering a sense of community where the notion of locking doors at night seemed unnecessary. The cabin boasted two bedrooms with the eldest child, John, occupying a small neglected room connected to the basement's utility area. Meanwhile, Rick and Greg are sharing one room located towards the front of the cabin. Tina and Sue shared another room situated towards the rear of the cabin. Sheila, who was temporarily absent, was in Oregon delivering a child that was promptly given up for adoption. Upon her return in mid-February 1981, she moved in with her family and shared a room with Sue and Tina. During this period, the family relied heavily on social welfare, food stamps, and $250 in financial assistance from the Navy, which was granted due to Sheila's ex-husband's military affiliation. The Sharp family had finally found stability after a lifetime of constant moving due to Sue's ex-husband's naval career. Settling down in one place for an extended period felt like a breath of fresh air. 
Sue embraced this newfound opportunity by enrolling in a business education through CETA, a federal program that generously provided financial support for her to attend classes at the local community college. The children, on the other hand, eagerly embraced their new environment in Quincy, a quaint town located a few miles south of Keddie. Enrolled in the local schools, they quickly formed their own circle of friends and became familiar faces among the teachers and staff. Their presence was known and appreciated within the community, adding to the positive experience that the Sharp family had found in Keddie. On a sunny Saturday in early spring, April 11, 1981, the Sharp household exuded an air of normalcy. The morning glided by seamlessly, setting the stage for a seemingly uneventful day. Little did they know that an unexpected turn of events was about to unfold. At precisely 1.30 in the afternoon, Sue and her 14-year-old daughter, Sheila, drove to the nearby town of Quincy to fetch John, Sue's son, who had spent the day in Quincy with his friend Dana Wingate, a fellow student at Quincy High School. Dana had recently moved to Keddy, joining his mother and stepfather in November 1980 after living with his father in Montana. Around 3.30 p.m., John and Dana departed once again, seemingly heading back to Quincy to spend the afternoon with some other friends. They had initially planned to return home later that evening, as Dana intended to stay overnight. However, Sue intervened, expressing concern for their safety and strictly forbidding them from hitchhiking or accepting rides from strangers. Despite their rebellious inclinations, the two teenagers reluctantly complied with Sue's demand, at least for the time being. Between 9.30 and 10 p.m., as darkness cloaked the streets of Quincy, the two teenagers found themselves standing on a street corner desperately attempting to hitch a ride back home. Their whereabouts during this crucial time remain unknown, leaving the question lingering as to who ultimately offered them a lift. As the evening unfolded at cabin 28, Saturday night seemed to follow its usual course. Sue opted to stay in, seeking a quiet evening at home, while her two daughters ventured next door to the Seabolt's place for a TV watching session. Sue's daughters had formed strong friendships with the Seabolt family. At around 9.30 p.m., Tina returned to cabin 28 while Sheila chose to spend the night with the Seabold. Meanwhile, Sue's two younger sons, Rick and Greg, were engaged in their own sleepover escapade with their neighborhood friend, Justin Smart, tucked away in the back bedroom of their cabin. As for John and Dana, their plans to return that evening lingered in uncertainty, leaving their exact arrival time a mystery. In the early hours of the ensuing day, Sheila Sharp finally made her way back home, arriving between 7 and 8 a.m. from the Seabolt's residence, mere steps away. As she opened the door, a putrid stench immediately invaded her senses, filling the room with a sickening presence. Stepping into the living room, her mind struggled to process the shocking scene unfolding before her eyes. There, lying on the floor, was her brother John, tightly bound and lying on his back, his face and neck smeared with dried blood. Beside him lay a young boy, also bound, his face pressed against the ground and partially cushioned by a pillow. As Sheila's gaze wandered further, it landed on a mysterious figure concealed beneath a yellow blanket. Gripped by terror, she sprinted towards the Seabolts, unleashing desperate cries for help. Sheila and Mrs. Seabolt hurriedly made their way to the closest functional telephone, situated at the landlord's cabin. From there, they dialed the Plumas County Sheriff Office to seek assistance. Responding promptly, the Plumas County Sheriff Office dispatched a patrol car to their location. Meanwhile, Sheila, accompanied by Zanita Seabolt and her son, Jamie Seabolt, returned to cabin 28, determined to locate the remaining members of their family. As they cautiously peered through the cabin's windows, a mix of anxiety and relief washed over them. Greg, Rick, and Justin were nestled inside the back bedroom, fast asleep, unaware of the chaos that had unfolded. Determined to shield the three younger boys from the horrifying spectacle outside their bedroom, they gently tapped on the window to rouse them from their sleep. Sensing the gravity of the situation, Jamie carefully guided them out through the window. Their innocence would be preserved, spared from carnage that unfolded before their eyes. As Jamie, the teenage son of the Seabold family, was tasked with investigating the neighboring cabin, his heart raced with anticipation. The stakes were high, as he needed to ascertain whether any signs of life still lingered amidst the unsettling chaos, although this action risked compromising potential evidence. 
Jamie made his way into the residence through the unsecured rear entrance, which had been carelessly left ajar by the assailants. After a swift but thorough search, he exited the cabin and regrouped with the others, waiting outside for the arrival of law enforcement. Inside cabin 28, investigators were met with a chilling discovery. Deputy Hank Clement was the first to arrive, only to be confronted by a sight of unimaginable horror. The walls and floors were drenched in a macabre display of blood. The victims themselves were found in a state of utter helplessness, bound tightly with a combination of medical tape and electrical wires stripped from various appliances and extension cords. They were at the mercy of their assailants. Young John was found near the front door, lying motionless with blood-stained hands tightly bound by medical tape. A solemn cut marked his throat. Beside John Sharp, Dana, his friend, lay face down. Electrical wire cruelly bound their ankles, linking them together in an eerie bond. Sue Sharp, her lifeless body shrouded partially by a yellow blanket bore signs of unimaginable cruelty, a sight that defied any attempt at concealment. Lying on her side, she lay unclothed from the waist down, but no signs of sexual assault were present. She was gagged tightly with a bandana and her own underwear secured mercilessly by medical tape. Like her son, her throat had been severely cut. Intriguingly, the victim's feet carried smears of blood, indicating they had been moved after their lives were brutally taken. Among the discoveries were two kitchen knives, one of which was a steak knife bearing the unmistakable marks of a violent encounter, its blade grotesquely bent. A hammer, a pellet gun, and a solitary pellet completed the unsettling scene, leading the investigators to surmise that the pellet gun had also been employed during the vicious attacks. Strikingly absent from the scene were any traces of medical tape prior to the murders, implying that the perpetrators had brought it with them solely for the purpose of immobilizing their captives. Furthermore, a toolbox housing an assortment of tools was conspicuously absent from the scene. As they examined the surroundings, they noticed that the telephone had been deliberately dislodged from its hook, its cord severed from the outlet, and the drapes meticulously drawn shut the bedroom, shared by Sue and her daughters, was a grisly scene, with bloodstains adorning the walls. The living room bore the marks of violence, with blood splattered across the ceiling and furniture. Even the doors of the bedrooms and the handrail of the outside staircase were not spared, bearing crimson traces. Additional evidence materialized in the form of a blood-soaked footprint discovered in the yard, along with menacing knife marks gouged into the walls of the once serene dwelling. Intriguingly, there were no signs of forced entry at the home. However, the detectives managed to stumble upon a lone, unidentified fingerprint on the handrail that traced its way to the back door. Compounding the mystery was the absence of any additional fingerprints, leading investigators to surmise that perpetrators likely took precautionary measures and wore gloves to avoid leaving any incriminating evidence behind. As hours ticked by, a grim realization eventually dawned upon the police the absence of a fourth victim, Tina Sharp, Sue's 12-year-old daughter, further shrouding this horrific crime in an ever-deepening mystery. Curiously absent from the cabin were Tina's cherished jacket and shoes, along with a shoebox she had crafted as part of a school assignment. The box held sentimental value for Tina, making its disappearance a crucial detail for unraveling the case. Evident on Tina's bed were unmistakable traces, droplets that whispered of a harrowing fate. The investigation unfolded, pointing towards a chilling possibility. She had been abducted for a despicable act of assault, deviating from the other's fate of being murdered within the confines of their home. Investigators narrowed down the time frame of the brutal attack to the dark hours between midnight and 2 a.m. Detailed autopsies conducted on April 13th unveiled the horrifying manner in which Sue's life was violently taken. Her existence was abruptly ended through a brutal combination of stabbing and strangulation. A deep wound had pierced her chest while her throat bore the gruesome mark of a horizontal knife attack. The brutality didn't end there. A visible bruise on the left side of her head matched the distinct shape of the butt of a Daisy 880 powerline, BB or pellet rifle. It was a harrowing sight as Sue succumbed to both the knife wounds and the relentless blunt force trauma. Similarly, John met a grisly fate with the evidence painting a disturbing picture of his final moments. A 
a deep cut marred the right side of his throat, suggesting a forceful encounter. The merciless force of a hammer had struck him on the right side of his head, leaving an indelible mark. The left eye, once vibrant, now carried the weight of deep bruises. John's life was extinguished by the combined impact of the knife wounds and the brutal hammer attack. Dana's untimely demise unfolded in a chilling sequence of events. The back right of his head bore the telltale sign of a laceration, a result of a traumatic blow. Yet the autopsy revealed more directly beneath the laceration. The unmistakable signs of blunt force trauma hinted at the use of another hammer, one distinct from the one found at the crime scene. Furthermore, the autopsy revealed that Dana had tragically been manually strangled to death. Ultimately, it was asphyxiation that claimed Dana's life. The local authorities wasted no time in initiating a thorough investigation, eager to unravel the shocking triple murder and the mysterious disappearance of Tina Sharp. Recognizing the gravity of the situation, the sheriff, Sylvester Douglas Thomas, who presided over the case, enlisted the assistance of the Justice Department to ensure a meticulous examination. As the investigation unfolded, neither Sheila nor the Seabolt family reported hearing any disturbances. However, during interviews conducted at Keddy Resort, investigators discovered a nearby couple who claimed to have heard faint screams around 1.30 a.m. Although the exact source remained elusive, among the suspects, Martin Smart, a neighbor, drew significant attention when he alleged that a claw hammer had mysteriously vanished from his residence. Plumas County Sheriff Sylvester Douglas Thomas, overseeing the case, later remarked on Martin's tendency to provide countless clues that seemed to divert suspicion away from himself. In addition to the Smart family, detectives also interviewed numerous locals and neighbors some of whom recalled witnessing a green van parked outside the Sharps' house at approximately 9 p.m. During the investigation, Justin Smart, who'd spent the night at the Sharps' residence, was also questioned by the detectives. However, Justin's narratives about the evening's events were riddled with contradictions. Initially, he claimed to have dreamed the gruesome details of the murders, but later asserted that he had actually witnessed them unfold. Under forensic hypnosis, Justin provided a revised account, recounting how he awoke in the bedroom alongside Rick and Greg, only to hear unsettling sounds emanating from the living room. Driven by curiosity, he ventured out to investigate the commotion and was startled to discover Sue in the company of two unfamiliar men. One sported a moustache and had short hair, while the other possessed long hair and a clean-shaven face. Intriguingly, both individuals wore glasses, according to Justin. The situation escalated when John and Dana arrived on the scene, engaging in a heated argument with the mysterious men. A violent altercation ensued, during which Tina entered the room and was swiftly whisked away through the cabin's rear exit by one of the strangers. Attempting to create a visual representation of the unidentified culprits, law enforcement sought the assistance of Harlan Embry. Curiously, Embry possessed no artistic talent or formal training in forensic sketching. It remained a baffling mystery as to why, despite having access to accomplished forensic artists from the Justice Department and the FBI, the authorities opted to enlist the services of an amateur like Embry who occasionally volunteered to aid local police. Accompanied by press releases, Composite sketches emerged from Embry's efforts, providing glimpses into the appearance of the unknown perpetrators. The descriptions revealed that the suspects fell within the age range of the late 20s to early 30s. One stood tall, ranging from 1.80 meters, 5 feet 11 inches, to 1.88 meters, 6 feet 2 inches, boasting dark blonde hair. The other, comparatively shorter, measured between 1.68 meters, 5 feet 6 inches, and 1.78 meters, 5 feet 10 inches, with slick, greased black hair. Both men distinctively adorned their faces with those striking gold-framed sunglasses. While the narrative surrounding Justin's involvement is undeniably captivating, it is worth considering that he may have been exposed to information about the case through media coverage during the four weeks that transpired following the murders. Furthermore, there are sources suggesting that the Police, during the hypnosis sessions, may have influenced Justin by introducing suggestions into the proceedings.
these factors introduce a level of complexity and raise questions about the reliability of Justin's accounts, adding another layer of intrigue to the investigation. There were rumours circulating that the crimes could be connected to rituals or illicit activities. However, Plumas County Sheriff Douglas Thomas dismissed these rumours, clarifying that no illicit substances or narcotics related items were found in the residence during the week following the murders. Carla McMullen, a family acquaintance, claimed that Dana Wingate had recently obtained an unspecified quantity of hallucinogens from local suppliers, although no concrete evidence was provided to support this assertion. The police also dismissed theories surrounding ritualistic killings, instead focusing on leads closer to the Sharp family's immediate environment. During the ongoing murder investigation, the FBI also focused on the disappearance of Tina, suspecting a potential abduction. However, news emerged on April 29, 1981, indicating that the FBI had withdrawn from the search, citing the California State Department of Justice's competent handling of the case as a reason for their departure. The state authorities were deemed capable of fulfilling the necessary duties, rendering the FBI's involvement unnecessary. In an attempt to discover any leads, police canines were employed in a thorough grid pattern search that spanned an eight-kilometer, five-mile radius around the house. Despite their concerted efforts, the search yielded no fruitful results, further deepening the mystery surrounding Tina's whereabouts. In the spring of 1984, three years after the murders, an unexpected discovery brought the long-forgotten Keddy murder case back into the spotlight, a bottle collector scouring the surroundings near Camp 18, close to Feather Falls in Butte County, stumbled upon a startling sight. Half buried amidst the earth and leaves lay the remains of a human skull and part of a mandible. This location, Camp 18, lay approximately 167 kilometers, 105 miles, away from Keddy, where Tina had gone missing. Initially, investigators speculated that these remains could belong to a Native American individual News of the discovery spread, reaching the Butte County Sheriff's Office. Shortly after the public announcement, an anonymous call was received, suggesting a possible connection between the remains and Tina Sharp, who had vanished three years earlier. In June 1984, subsequent DNA analysis confirmed that the bones indeed belonged to Tina Sharp. Tragically, the circumstances surrounding her death remained shrouded in mystery. Amidst the renewed investigation, law enforcement conducted a thorough search in the vicinity of the grim discovery. Near the spot where Tina's remains were found, they uncovered a faded blue nylon jacket, a worn blanket, a pair of Levi Strauss jeans with a missing back pocket, and an empty medical tape dispenser. The revelation of Tina's fate reignited public interest in the Keddy murders, sparking renewed speculation and the resurfacing of old rumors Despite the renewed attention and claims of overlooked leads and blatant evidence, the investigation ultimately reached a dead end. Tina had been found, but no significant breakthroughs materialized. The case remained unsolved, leaving a haunting void in the hearts of those who sought justice. Despite capturing nationwide attention, the Keddy Cabin murders remain an unsolved quadruple homicide enveloped in an enduring veil of mystery. The case has spawned a multitude of theories, suspects, and unanswered questions, further deepening the enigma surrounding these tragic events. One early suspect who drew scrutiny in the murder investigation was Martin Smart, the stepfather of Justin Smart. Smart, along with his wife Marilyn and her two sons, resided in Cabin 26, located just across from the Sharps' residence, placing them in close proximity to the crime scene. Interestingly enough, both Smart and Marilyn were enrolled in the same typewriting class as Sue. A potential motive existed for Smart to cause harm to Sue Sharp. It appeared that Sue had become involved in their marital issues, attributing Marilyn's consideration of divorce to Smart, which could have potentially triggered his actions. In May 1981, a mysterious counselor from the Veterans Administration shared startling information about Smart with the Sacramento Bee. During Smart's seventh session, just weeks after the Keddie murders. Smart allegedly confessed to the brutal murders of Sue and Tina Sharp, but denied any involvement in the boys' deaths. The counselor recalled Smart's chilling words, stating, I killed the woman and her daughter, but I didn't have anything to do with the boys. 
This recollection dates back to May 1981. At the time, Smart may have believed that his confession would remain confidential. However, the law dictates otherwise when it comes to confessing to murder. The counsellor recalled that Smart appeared remarkably composed while discussing Sue's murder until the moment Tina's name was mentioned. Smart horrifyingly revealed that he had to kill Tina because she had witnessed the entire crime and could be a potential witness and that he had incapacitated her to prevent her escape. When questioned about his motive, Smart believed Sue was responsible for his wife wanting a divorce. Despite the counsellor's urging to turn himself in, Smart merely smiled. When asked about a polygraph test he had taken at the request of law enforcement after the murders, Smart said to his counsellor, I beat it. Those things are easy to beat. I was lying and they let me go. The counsellor, alarmed by this horrifying confession, did his duty and informed the Department of Justice. However, to his dismay, his revelation did not lead to an arrest. The counsellor even met with special agents Bradley and Krim, who dismissed his allegations as mere hearsay, leaving justice elusive. In Marilyn's interviews, she disclosed that her husband had a history of violence. Incidents were cited such as his alleged attempt to run over her and their son, as well as an episode where he brandished a knife at her and threatened to cut her in 1980. Additionally, there were claims that after losing his job as a cook, Smart ventured into the world of illegal substance production and distribution. Given these circumstances, it becomes quite understandable why Marilyn would have sought a divorce after enduring such hardships in her marriage. In Marilyn's account, she claimed that her husband harbored a profound disdain for Sue, emphasizing that he barely knew her at all. Martin's contempt for women seemed to extend to all of them as he consistently used derogatory labels to degrade them in his twisted perspective. In addition to his animosity towards women, Marilyn disclosed that her husband harbored an intense dislike for Sue's teenage son, John Sharp, going so far as to issue threats to break John's hands, seemingly due to a misguided belief that John was nothing more than a troublemaker. The incident occurred in the month of March, leaving a lingering sense of unease. Marilyn also spoke about her husband's contempt for teenagers as a whole. His disdain encompassed Sue's son, Ricky, whom he derogatorily labelled as a pothead, as well as Sue's daughter, Tina Sharp, whom he shamelessly referred to with derogatory terms. It was clear that his general aversion towards the younger generation manifested itself in cruel and demeaning remarks. Further, she recounted the events of that fateful night. She vividly described how she, Smart and Bobid, arrived at Keddie's back door bar around 10pm, wearing sleek suits and stylish sunglasses. Some speculate that their choice of attire was a deliberate attempt to attract attention, possibly to establish an alibi. However, their stay at the bar was brief as they became visibly upset when the co-owner switched the music genre from country to rock. Expressing their discontent, they promptly made a call to complain and swiftly left the establishment. Upon reaching home, Marilyn decided to retire for the night at 11 p.m. Surprisingly, Smart and Bobid, despite having just departed, returned to the bar once again after placing another complaint call. Notably, some sources suggest that they didn't put on their suits and sunglasses until their second visit to the bar. According to Smart's statement to investigators, they eventually left the bar around closing time, which was approximately 2 a.m. In an attempt to ascertain his credibility, Smart underwent a polygraph examination, which he reportedly passed with flying colors. After the Keddie murders, Smart left Keddy and travelled to Reno, Nevada. Interestingly, it was discovered that Marilyn and her children vacated their home and left Martin Smart behind on the day the murders were discovered, adding to the intrigue surrounding the case. Another individual who came under suspicion in the Keddie murders case was Martin Smart's friend, John Bobid. On the night of the murders, Bobid was reportedly with Smart, adding to the intrigue surrounding his possible involvement. Some sources claim that Smart and Bobid crossed paths while undergoing treatment at the psychiatric unit of the Veterans Administration in Reno, Nevada. However, the accuracy of this encounter remains disputed, as some argue that they may have met elsewhere. Moreover, there were suspicions surrounding Martin's involvement in the narcotics trade, which allegedly stemmed from his association with Bobid. During Smart's time at the Veteran Administration, he exhibited symptoms consistent with PTSD. 
However, skeptics argue that his motives were primarily financial, speculating that he aimed to exploit his veteran status to secure additional monetary compensation and benefits. A counselor who interviewed Smart disclosed that he claimed to have worked as a cook on a military base, never experiencing active combat. In fact, Smart allegedly characterized his military service as a relatively effortless endeavor. On the other hand, Bobid had a military background, serving in the Air Force, but subsequent investigations revealed that numerous allegations made by him were false. Notably, he had a criminal record and had served time in Chicago's Statesville prison for armed robbery. Furthermore, connections between Bobid and the Chicago outfit Mafia have been uncovered during the course of the Keddie Cabin murders investigation. In the weeks leading up to the tragic Keddie Cabin murders, Bobid sought temporary accommodation on Smart's couch. When questioned about the murders, he made false claims, asserting that Marilyn was his niece and that he had been a police informant for the Chicago Department of Justice. Speculation arises that such claims might have discouraged thorough scrutiny by the Sacramento Department of Justice, possibly because they wanted to retain Bobid as a valuable informant. One theory posits that Bobid may have received protection from the Justice Department as he was believed to be an informant against his associates within the Chicago mob. This might explain why the special agents dispatched to Keddie by the Justice Department were associated with organized crime rather than being specifically trained in homicide investigations. It also provides an explanation as to why the two lead suspects were seemingly given a free pass and told to leave town. During the FBI interrogation, Bobid made a curious claim, asserting that Marilyn was wide awake when they returned from their second bar trip. This statement directly contradicted Martin Smart's account, where he stated Marilyn was fast asleep upon their arrival. This inconsistency should have raised eyebrows, but it went unnoticed. In Marilyn's interviews, she provided some insightful information. When asked if Bobid had ever met Sue Sharp, Marilyn revealed that Bobid had encountered Sue on the night of April 8, 1981. As far as Marilyn knew, Bobid had not seen her again after that night. However, Bobid adamantly denied ever meeting Sue Sharp, which directly contradicted Marilyn's account of Bobid having encountered Sue. The FBI then inquired if Bobid had ever mentioned anything about Sue. Marilyn disclosed that the day after meeting Sue, Bobid expressed an interest in getting to know her better. However, after that initial mention, Bobid didn't bring up the subject of Sue again. The focus then shifted to Marilyn's description of Bobid. The conversation then turned to whether Bobid had ever discussed taking someone's life. Marilyn disclosed that he had spoken about committing armed robberies and killing people. Bobid shared a tragic story with Marilyn, stating that his own daughter had been sexually assaulted and that he had taken the life of the perpetrator. Curious about Bobid's past, Marilyn questioned if this was the reason he had been incarcerated. Bobid dismissed the notion claiming that the body had never been discovered and never would be. These revelations painted a complex picture of Bobid's character, raising further questions about his involvement in potential criminal activities. Surprisingly, no further interviews were conducted with Smart or Bobid, as the investigators believed they had no involvement in murders. With Martin Smart no longer considered a prime suspect, he relocated to Klamath, California. He passed away in June 2000, at his residence in Portland, Oregon, after battling cancer. On the other hand, Bobid returned to Chicago and engaged in fraudulent activities, successfully tricking several police officers out of their money. However, his luck eventually ran out and he was apprehended, narrowly avoiding imprisonment. Unfortunately, he passed away in 1988 in Chicago before serving his sentence. Following Tina's disappearance, the detectives launched an investigation to uncover the possible motives behind her abduction. Their attention soon turned to Joel Walker Lipsy, an intriguing figure who worked as a special education teacher at Tina's school. Although Tina only attended his class part-time, Lipsy displayed an inexplicable fascination with her. Unusual as it may seem, Lipsy kept a photograph of Tina on his desk at school and another one at home. It was evident that Tina held a special place in Lipsy's heart but not in the conventional sense of the term. Drawing inspiration from FBI Special Agent John Douglas's theory, some investigators speculated that Lipsy had groomed Tina before his sinister acts took place. Shockingly, 
Lipsy had a dark past as a convicted child molester, having been found guilty of engaging in lewd or lascivious acts with a child under 14. However, when the police called Lipsy in for questioning, he presented a solid alibi, leaving them no closer to identifying the true culprit. Tragically, Lipsy passed away in 2015, leaving the mystery of Tina's disappearance and the identity of the perpetrator unresolved. While Sue's ex-husband, who resided in a different part of the country during the time of the crime, was undoubtedly innocent, the potential involvement of Sue's other romantic partners remained open for investigation. Over the course of her 18-month stay in Keddie, Sue had been involved with three different romantic partners, although none of these relationships were particularly deep or committed. Law enforcement authorities thoroughly examined Sue's romantic connections, but they appeared to have been excluded as suspects. The most recent boyfriend had seen Sue two days prior to the tragic events, which indicated that he was unlikely to be the perpetrator. However, the possibility remains that one of the boyfriends, including the latest one, might have been involved. But there is limited publicly available evidence that would categorize any of them as strong suspects. There are indications pointing towards potential connections between John and Dana and illegal substances. According to an article published in the Feather River Bulletin in May 1987, John Sharp was implicated in a burglary during which a controlled substance was stolen. Similarly, Dana Wingate was under court supervision and on probation at that time. Moreover, Carla McMullen, a family acquaintance, stepped forward, alleging that Dana had stolen hallucinogenic substances from local suppliers. However, no substantial evidence could be discovered to validate this accusation. It's hard to fathom that such brutal killings and abductions could be motivated merely by a dispute over a small amount of hallucinogens. The intensity of the response would be disproportionate and extreme for such a scenario. One theory about the Keddie murders suggests they were ritualistic killings, possibly tied to occult ceremonies. Proponents of this idea point to the body's positioning and the presence of strange symbols at the crime scene as potential evidence, adding to the intrigue Peculiar symbols were discovered, along with a small amount of red paint or substance splattered on a door and wall in the cabin. Some interpret these markings as occult symbols or signs linked to ritual practices. However, the exact nature and significance of these symbols remain uncertain, leaving room for other explanations or coincidences. Speculation surrounds the tragic murders, suggesting that they may have been the unintended outcome of a botched robbery. Indeed, the weapons employed in the killings were procured from within the residence. This raises an intriguing question. If the intention was to enter the dwelling with the sole purpose of taking lives, wouldn't the perpetrators have brought their own weapons? Lacking concrete evidence, theft from cabin 28 remains unsubstantiated. The Sharps, not particularly affluent, likely possessed little of value to attract a robber's attention. So if the motive was theft, why would the perpetrators select this seemingly unprofitable target? Moreover, if the intention was solely robbery, the level of violence unleashed on the victims appears disproportionate. The heinous acts committed suggest an intensity of rage and anger seldom associated with routine burglaries. Nevertheless, as with any hypothesis, we cannot dismiss the possibility that a robber or robbers entered the cabin only to grow infuriated upon finding nothing of worth. Subsequently, in a fit of wrath, they may have subjected the victims to torture and ultimately abduction, as in the case of Tina. In the year 2004, the infamous cabin, 28, the site of the gruesome murders, met its end as it was demolished. The details of this chilling case were brought to light in a compelling documentary that surfaced in 2008. Marilyn, a prominent figure in the documentary, expressed her unwavering belief that Smart and Bobid were the culprits responsible for the murders. Contradicting her claims, Sheriff Douglas Thomas, also featured in the documentary, revealed that Smart had successfully passed a polygraph test previously administered by the sheriff. Interestingly, it was later uncovered that Smart had a close relationship with Sheriff Thomas, adding fuel to suspicions of a cover-up. The reputation of Sheriff Douglas Thomas was marred by corruption allegations in subsequent years raising concerns about compromised investigative practices. 
Critics accused Sheriff Thomas of intentionally mishandling the case and shielding potential suspects linked to the murders. They alleged that crucial evidence was disregarded, credible leads were left unexplored, and suspects associated with influential community members were dismissed without due diligence. Despite these accusations, concrete evidence establishing Sheriff Thomas's involvement in any cover-up or corruption has yet to surface. The case remains open, with investigators persistently pursuing leads in their quest to bring closure to this chilling crime. Sheriff Douglas Thomas consistently maintains his innocence and denies any knowledge of or involvement in a cover-up. Marilyn also disclosed that she had woken up at 2 a.m. on the morning of the murders, only to witness Martin and Bobid surreptitiously burning an unidentified object in the wood stove. She went on to reveal that she had found a blood-stained jacket supposedly belonging to Tina Sharp. Marilyn asserted that she handed over the jacket to the police, but no record of this exchange exists in the police case file. Recapturing another peculiar incident from that fateful night, Marilyn recalled how Martin and Bobid coerced her into inviting Sue for drinks as a ploy to involve Sue with Bobid. Sue, being a non-drinker, declined the invitation, which infuriated Smart and Bobid. In the documentary's second installment, Martin Smart's friend DJ Lake shared a significant encounter they had following the murders. Dee revealed that they met up shortly after the murders. While the location eluded his memory, it definitely took place in Quincy. In their conversation, Smart expressed concern about the abundance of evidence linking him to the crime. Seeking Dee's advice, he asked, Dee, they have over 30 pieces of evidence connecting me to this murder. What do you think I should do? DJ's initial response was straightforward yet probing. He couldn't help but ask, Well, did you do it? Additionally, he pointed out the potential implications, saying, If you're asking that, it implies you might be an accessory and you'll have to face the consequences. Inquiring further, D asked Marty if any legal action had been taken against him or if he had received any warrants or notices from the judicial system. Marty confirmed that he hadn't. Prompted by these circumstances, DJ advised, Well, I'd get on the bus, Gus. I think you must. You know your personal life has gone to hell anyway, and you're not ever going to find a job here. School's about over. You've got no other future. All right. You need to go somewhere else. Though DJ expressed his disbelief in Marty's involvement, he admitted that during his college and law classes, he learned that anyone is capable of committing murder. Within the same documentary, a recorded police interview with Smart brought forth a captivating revelation when the topic of Justin arose. He suggested, there's a very high possibility that he could have been awake or alerted to something unusual in that house, and he's quiet enough to where he could have noticed something without me detecting him. This remark could be seen as an inadvertent admission of Smart's possible presence at the scene. Even more disturbingly, he goes into chilling detail about how he would carry out the perfect murder if he were the culprit. In 2013, new investigators, namely Plumas, Sheriff Greg Hagwood and Special Investigator Mike Gamberg, reopened the case, hoping to unravel the truth that had eluded them for so long. Sheriff Hagwood, who had been a personal friend of the Sharp family and was just 16 at the time of the murders, Gamberg also had a familiarity with the victims, as he had taught martial arts to both John and Dana. In fact, Gamberg recalls that Dana had been at his home the day before his tragic death. As Gamberg sorted through the evidence, he discovered a disorganized mess. Certain items were contaminated, the case history log was nowhere to be found, and everything was out of place. Frustrated, he remarked. This case is a complete disaster focusing on what was neglected rather than what was accomplished. However, amidst this chaos, an important development emerged when Gamberg stumbled upon a sealed envelope in the case files. Inside was a cassette tape containing a 911 call recording from an anonymous caller who claimed to know that the remains found in the woods belonged to Tina Sharp even before the official confirmation by the medical examiner. The tape is now being analyzed to determine if the voice matches any recordings of previous suspects or witnesses, a significant breakthrough occurred in March 2016 when Special Investigator Mike Gamberg was informed about the discovery of a blue-handled claw hammer in a nearby pond in Keddie. 
The hammer was identical to the one Martin Smart had claimed to have lost nearly three and a half decades ago. It was promptly seized as evidence by Gamberg. Sheriff Hagwood made a public statement regarding the discovery of the hammer, asserting the location it was found, it would have been intentionally put there. It would not have been accidentally misplaced. Six unnamed suspects were under investigation, unearthing new leads. Upon investigation, he discovered that neither the sheriff's office nor the FBI had ever searched the pond for evidence back in 1981. In the midst of the renewed investigation in 2016, a letter came to the attention of Gamberg. This letter, penned by Martin to his wife Marilyn, just a fortnight after the murder, gained quite a reputation among many as a potential admission of guilt. Particularly, one sentence from the letter echoed throughout numerous articles. I've paid the price of your love, and now that I've bought it with four people's lives, you tell me we are through. Great. What else do you want? Based on the contents of the letter, it appears that its essence does not pertain to any wrongdoing, but rather revolves around Martin Smart's children, his own flesh and blood, whom he had forsaken to be with Marilyn. It seems that the real intent behind his words has been misconstrued by others, leading to misconceptions. While there are several pieces of evidence pointing to Martin Smart's involvement, this particular letter does not quite fit into that category. Marilyn, who had since remarried, shared that she had no recollection of receiving such a letter. According to her, she only became aware of its existence when investigators brought it up long after the fact. However, she did recognize her former husband's distinctive handwriting. In April 2018, new DNA evidence emerged, redirecting investigators' attention to other potential suspects who are still alive. Although Martin Smart and Bobid have since passed away, DNA recovered from a piece of medical tape found at the crime scene positively matched that of a known living suspect. Puma Sheriff Hagwood voiced his belief that more than two individuals played a role in the entirety of the crime, including disposing of the evidence and abducting Tina Sharp. He emphasized that there are several people fitting those roles who are still alive. It's my belief that there were more than two people who were involved in the totality of the crime. The disposal of the evidence and the abduction of the little girl, Hagwood said. We're convinced that there are a handful of people who fit those roles who are still alive. Since then, no new information regarding the Keddie murders has been made public, leaving the case shrouded in mystery. In conclusion, the Keddie murder case remains a haunting mystery, leaving many questions unanswered. However, based on the available evidence and the confessions made by Martin Smart, it is highly plausible that he and his accomplice, John Bobid, were responsible for the heinous crime. The presence of Smart's generalized animosity towards women and teenagers, combined with a specific reason to harbor resentment towards Sue, as confessed to a veteran administration counselor, carries substantial weight in his admissions. Individuals rarely confess to crimes they didn't commit willingly, as it goes against their self-interest and has serious legal repercussions. However, false confessions do occur but they typically result from law enforcement tactics such as intimidation, force, coercion, isolation during interrogations, and deceptive methods involving false evidence claims. In a counseling environment for veterans, there is no need for such tactics to be employed, which theoretically reduces the likelihood of false admissions. Considering this, along with the other incriminating factors such as the matching hammer, the burning of clothes witnessed by Marilyn, and Smart's sudden departure from Keddie shortly after the murders makes it increasingly difficult to dismiss his claims, further strengthening the likelihood of his involvement. Nevertheless, despite the accumulation of evidence and compelling circumstances, the ultimate truth of what transpired that fateful night may forever remain elusive. The Keddie murder case serves as a reminder that darkness can take hold beneath the surface of seemingly ordinary lives leaving behind a legacy of pain, unanswered questions, and a quest for justice that endures. As we reflect on this chilling case, we are reminded of the significance of preserving the memories and stories of victims, ensuring that their voices are not silenced by the passage of time. And we can only hope that someday further revelations or advancements in forensic technology may shed new light on the truth behind the Keddie murders. Until then, the Keddie murders will remain an unsettling chapter in history an unsolved puzzle that will continue to intrigue and haunt us. Thanks for watching. 
If you found this video fascinating, don't forget to like, subscribe and share. Let us know in the comments if there are any other unsolved mysteries you'd like us to explore. And as always, prioritize your safety. Until next time.